Hi, welcome to the session on CMA part two, strategic financial management. In this session, we'll discuss about investment decisions. Investment decisions about, you know, the capital investment called capital expenditure or CapEx where on this expenditure we can get the benefits over a period of time like three to five years time or 10 years time. So we need to have a strategic plan before we invest money into a project that what amount is required, what amounts we are getting over a period of the life of the project called capital budgeting. Decisions taken on the heavy investments where you get the returns for a period of the project lifetime is called a capital budgeting. So we study well in advance that whether is it worth investing this money or not using some techniques. So the capital budgeting process begins with a huge investment in a project to gain heavy wealth, profit maximization. The goal of capital investment is to maximize the wealth. And capital investment is a long-term investment. It's not an operating expenditure like rent, salaries, printing, stationery, and all. Where you get benefit within that period. But in a capex, capital expenditure, you get the returns on long-term basis. So you need huge investment. Huge investments in the acquisition of fixed assets like land, building, acquiring some rights, franchise rights, launching a new product. Okay, so all these amounts which you spend, we call them as capex, capital expenditure. So the simple point where an amount which you spend is a capex or operating expenditure, you should see that uh, the benefit, the benefit out of this expenditure is going to be received by the corporate within a year or over a period of like three to five years time, or 10 years time. When a benefit received by a corporate over a period of time greater than a year, the amount spent is called capital expenditure. A company buys a car, a company buys a truck delivery van, a company buys a piece of land to construct a factory building on it. Capex. A company buys a printing stationery and all, you know, OPEX, operating expenditure. Because the benefit we receive a period less than a year operating expenditure. So we are now talking about capital expenditure. Let's assume that we need uh, $60,000 of cash outlay. We are acquiring a new machine and we study that the new machine is going to be effective for a period of 15 years where we can extract some production from this machine. So obviously the $60,000 of expenditure should be called as capex. Capital expenditure means the amount which we spent is transferred to the balance sheet, not to the income statement. Say for example, you paid some you know, rental amount on this machine. You hired a machine and you're paying say for example, $1,000 a month. It's a rental expenditure, operating expenditure. It goes to the profit and loss account. Repairs, maintenance, this and all will go to 
the income statement as an operating expenditure. But this 60,000 will go to the balance sheet. What are the key motives for a corporate makes this kind of capex? The key motives include we may need to expand our operations. So when you plan to expand your operations, obviously we need extra resources, maybe a plan, building, plant, machinery and all. So we need money. We need money to acquire land. We need to, you need money to buy a machinery. We want to replace the equipment. We have an equipment which is of very old and we want to extract extra production from that. So we want to replace the equipment. Yes, we need huge money. We want to renew some licenses, franchise rights. We need money, huge amount. Launching a new product. Okay, starting a foreign branch. Think of these motives where you need huge investment called capital expenditure. Is it worth investing in this kind of, you know, capex? Motives are okay, but is it worth? We need to see the steps in, a, you know, the process. First of all, we generated a proposal that with this investment, what we are going to get. Yeah, we review and conduct an analysis. Then we make a decision, is it worth or not? Based on the review and analysis, we make a decision. Yes, go ahead. So we arrange capital and invest money called implementation. The next step after making a decision is the implementation. We arrange money implemented. Yes, the project is on, but we need to see that whether we are receiving the benefits as for as per the proposal generated in step one, monitoring, follow up, a feedback, an audit, post implementation audit to see that whether the project is really doing well as we generated a proposal. So the stages in a capital budgeting includes the identification of new opportunities where you can maximize the wealth with an additional investment. The moment you understand that there is some requirement where we have some opportunity, we are in the requirement of some additional funds, we need to arrange some cash, the investment, then apply capital budgeting techniques to identify the most profitable projects. Then prepare a capital budget, then conduct an audit whether everything is going fine or not. So the steps we follow in the investment decisions is the project generation, cash flow calculations, identification of the risk which we have in this project then we implement and we conduct an audit. A post-investment audit is very important for every project because we can make corrections from this because we have some kind of, you know, projections and uh, the actual results, what we get from the project after the implementation must have to be compared with the projections to see that whether the project is really working well or not. So this is nothing but a feedback about the performance of the project. So we need to have a clear post investment audit from time to time, which will help the management to make the decisions. In investment decisions, we need to understand certain terms like sunk cost, opportunity cost, 
okay the investment the cash flows the cash flows which are remain same over a period of time or fluctuating cash flows etc sunk cost sunk cost is a cost which is incurred in the past which has been already incurred say for example you acquired some rights on certain asset intangible assets and you paid say fifty thousand dollars for a period of five years you acquired rights so first year there was an outflow of fifty thousand dollars second year third year fourth year fifth year you are using these rights to generate cash flows so this fifty thousand dollars is called sunk cost one more example you purchased a vehicle a delivery van for fifty thousand dollars whose life effective life is five years so first year there is an outflow of fifty thousand dollars you are using this vehicle in the business for a period of five years so second third fourth and fifth years you don't have any cash outflow of this fifty thousand dollars but still you are using the asset therefore you recognize the cost of the asset over a period of five years which is called depreciation so depreciation is a sunk cost as the cash flow already took place in the first year itself therefore it is not relevant to your future decisions sunk cost is the cost incurred in the far past relevant costs relevant cost is a cost of a certain decision when you take a decision then related to the decision what amount you spend is called relevant cost say for example you have one machine in the factory for the last two years you are producing using a work with one machine now you are planning to acquire another machine so you have total two machines so your maintenance cost will go up you need extra space for this the rental cost will go up you need two supervisors to monitor this these two machines earlier we used to have only one supervisor that extra one more supervisor cost will go up these are all called relevant costs of course you will have benefit because your production is going up you sell more goods having this extra machinery so the benefit what we have is relevant benefit so the additional benefit what we receive is to be compared with the additional cost what we incurred to see that whether project is really worth or not then you will come across certain you know costs which are called avoidable costs unavoidable costs avoidable costs are those which can be avoided by having a decision like say for example you have a machinery but you don't own it you just took this on rental basis where you are paying $12000 a year as rent now you are planning whether we should have our own machine we need 1 million dollars to acquire one machine so instead of paying rent this $12000 every month shall we buy one machine yes when we, once we buy a machine you need 1 million dollars of investment that's okay fine but this $12000 can be avoided completely because you need one machine now you are planning to buy on your own so the rental machine rented machine can be returned so you are avoiding this $12000 but your factory rent cannot be avoided isn't it the supervisor salary cannot be avoided so certain costs are avoidable certain costs are unavoidable so we know about sunk cost we know about avoidable unavoidable costs relevant costs and relevant benefits what is an opportunity cost opportunity cost is a cost that 
is foregone by not accepting another best alternative. Let me give you an example. Say you have $1 million of deposit in the bank, which is invested in a bank at the rate of 5% interest. So this $1 million deposit is fetching a return of $50,000 of interest every year. Yeah. Now you're planning to break this fixed deposit with the bank and you want to invest this money in a business because we are planning to buy a new machine which requires 1 million. So you go break this $1 million investment from bank. You don't have any deposit lying there because this amount is turned to buy a machine. We purchased a machine. Earlier, when this deposit was there with the bank, you used to get $50,000, right? So this is your opportunity cost. The benefit foregone by accepting the other alternative option. So here, this machine should give you the returns over and above $50,000 a year because you had an opportunity to get $50,000 every year, right? Opportunity cost is a hurdle rate that you must have to earn a minimum amount. It is also known as the cost of capital. The amount which you invested in the business will have a cost. It is also known as implicit cost. Also called as required rate of return. It does not have any actual cash outlay but you need to assume that if this amount is borrowed out of paid right that is called opportunity cost so every investment you need to check whether it is covering the opportunity costs and what about what and above what you earn is the actual profit because just opportunity cost doesn't help you that is the amount you are earning anyway the other one, other side. Unlimited funds versus capital rationing. What does it mean? That the company has enough amount of funds to accept all the profitable projects or we have some restrictions on the amounts required. Say for example, we studied two projects, two projects, two projects are very attractive projects. These projects require an investment of like $50,000 is required to accept project A and $70,000 investment is required to accept project B. Very attractive projects. I studied these two projects. They are very really attractive projects. Now I want to accept both the projects. Yes, I would like to go with A and B. I have $125,000 open for investments. If any projects that give us returns, I'm ready to invest $125,000. I have money with me. All right, so from $125,000, can I invest in project A? Yes. Still, I have $75,000 of surplus money. Can I also invest in project B? Yes. Still, I have $5,000 extra, even after accepting project B. So, I have unlimited funds. Both the projects are independent projects. Independent projects means the acceptance of one project does not stop the acceptance of the other project. Okay, we understand that this A and B are independent projects. Why? Because $125,000 of my open investment is sufficient enough 
to accept both the projects A and B still have some surplus money I can deposit this money in a bank get interest on that but what happens if I have only $75,000 this is open for investment I have only $75,000 now I have the very attractive projects project A and project B if I invest in project A which requires 50,000 so I have a surplus money of only $25,000 can I invest in project B no because project B requires $70,000 project B requires $70,000 whereas I have a surplus money of only $25,000 so the acceptance of project A will reject the acceptance of project B let me use this money only to accept project B yes I can accept project B but I have a surplus money of only 5,000 75,000 minus 70,000 I have only 5,000 with this 5,000 can I accept project A no 5,000 is not enough because project A requires $50,000 so these two projects A and B are called mutually exclusive projects mutually exclusive projects so the acceptance of one project will not allow me to accept the other projects because my company is having some capital rationing capital rationing means we are running short of capital amount so we cannot accept both the projects therefore we can call that the company is in a capital rationing whereas if you have unlimited funds yes we can accept all the profitable projects and the projects are said to be independent projects if you have a capital rationing we cannot accept all the profitable projects therefore we call the projects are mutually exclusive so independent projects mutually exclusive projects the classification purely depends on the amount available we have sufficient money the projects are independent no we have only a certain amount which is not enough to accept all the profitable projects the projects are said to be mutually exclusive so each project will compete with others other project so we'll have to select the most profitable project by comparing the amount available with the amount required question which of the following is an accurate example of mutually exclusive project mutually exclusive project capital rationing amount is not enough though the profit you know projects are profitable a manager can choose to invest both the projects a and b the same time then we don't call them as mutually exclusive we call them as what independent projects a manager can choose between investing in either a or b but not both makes sense right makes sense a manager can choose to invest in project a first and then b shortly after the start of project a still they are called you know uh, independent projects because you are going to accept both so the right the best answer is what b you can either choose a or b but not both now when you are accepting or rejecting a particular project not just only we see the investment we also see the result of the project that's what I said the most profitable projects it doesn't mean that the projects just because you have enough funds you need to accept all the projects no the acceptance and rejecting a particular project depends upon the ranking based on the amount invested based on the amount which we receive the next terms which you need to understand 
in a capital budgeting or conventional and non-conventional cash flow patterns. I invested in a project of $50,000. The project life is five years. So during these five years, I'll get cash flows, operating cash flows. These are all my profits from this project with an investment of $50,000. So there is an outflow of 50,000. We have inflows of five years amounts. Question comes that I have a saving of $50,000. Okay, I'm ready to invest because profit, this uh, this project seems to be profitable. But do I need to invest any further money in the second year or third year or fourth year like that? Hmm, not just only the initial investment. We may have to invest some more amounts during the life of the project. So based on this question, the answers will give you whether it is a conventional cash flow or non-conventional cash flow. Conventional cash flow, one time investment, the next you will get the inflows. Whereas non conventional, you will have to invest in between. It's not, in, it's not enough. See, you invested at the beginning of first year, that is zero, $20,000. There is an investment required further to renew the license or repairs, heavy maintenance etc etc you need further amount just don't think that this project will cost you only twenty thousand dollars there is an investment required eight thousand dollars in the year five non-conventional cash flow so while evaluating the capital investments you need to even check that this project requires one-time investment or is there any requirement that the cash to be invested during the life of the project Conventional, non-conventional. Relevant cash flows, the amounts which we get from the project, once the project is accepted and it is an after-tax cash flow, you can get this amount from the projects once implemented. So you need to understand the major cash flow components in every capital budgeting initial investment. This is the amount required to accept any project. Initial investment is the investment required at the beginning of first year, that is zero year, in a sense, at the beginning of first year. Let's assume that we are following calendar year. So January, we need this money and December we will get inflow that is called operating cash inflows. So in this example, on January 1st, you invested $50,000 in a project. Okay. The project is of five years life. So you will get five years inflows. Say first year, you got $15,000 from this project. Second year, you got $20,000. Third, third year, you got $33,000. Fifth year, you got $18,000. So fourth year, you got $18,000. Fifth year, you got $12,000. Yes. So the amount which you invested here at the beginning of the year is an outflow minus $50,000 gone out initial investment. We successfully implemented this project and getting the cash flows after tax cash flows, $15,000 first year, 20, second year, 33, third year, 18, fourth year, fifth year, 12,000 operating cash inflows. Okay, the cash flows which we receive from the implemented project are called operating cash inflows. And the project life is only five years. I just terminated this project. I sold some inventory. I sold some old machine and all. The project is terminated. I got $3,000. This is called terminal cash flow. It is also an inflow. I'm not writing a minus sign here because it is an inflow. 
So minus sign is with only this amount, $50,000 outflow. So terminal cash flow is the amount that is received upon the termination of the project. Like you sell some, you know, old machinery, you collect from your receivables, you sell inventory, the project is closed. So whatever you realize by disposing of the ending inventories and all for terminal cash flow. And while operating this project, what amounts you get is called operating cash flow. So you understand about the initial investment, which is an outlay, operating cash inflows, the amounts which we received during the life of the project, terminal cash flow upon terminating the project, what amount we get is called terminal cash flow. So we can take one more example here. We invested $50,000 we received over a period of 10 years, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 7,000, 8,000. These are all called operating cash inflows. And the project life is only 10 years. In the 10th year, besides getting operating cash inflow of 10,000, as we sold the inventory leftover and we collected from receivables, we settled everything and we got $25,000 upon termination. So there is a terminal cash flow of $25,000. You may ask a question that, okay, we invested $50,000, expecting that the cash, this project will run for 10 years. It is a successful project. It run for 10 years and uh, even we got some terminal cash flow. You may ask a question here that what happens in the fifth year itself if this project is a failure project? Do we need to continue still 10th year incurring losses? No, we'll terminate itself here itself. We sell this machinery, we sell any inventory left, etc. etc. So terminal cash flow can be from a successful project, can be from an unsuccessful project. It is simply when you close a project, when you close a project, what amount you get from that investment is called terminal cash flow. It did not be always a successful project. Initial investment, how do you calculate initial investment? The amount $50,000, how did you arrive at? The initial investment is also known as the outlay or initial outlay. It's a capital expenditure. So in simple, you just follow this rule, A plus B minus C. A is the amount required to, to you know, acquire the asset. B is the amount required to operate this asset. And C is the amount which you receive if you sell any old asset when you buy this new asset. So to be more clear, let us assume that we are buying a missionary we are buying a missionary will cost us say $200,000. So we'll have to pay vendor $200,000. But this vendor is an exporter, okay, from a different country. So we'll have to pay a transportation of $10,000, yeah. We will install this machine spending $5,000. We will train our workers on this new machine incurring another $3,000. So the initial investment is not $200,000 which you paid to the vendor. Okay. You spent $10,000 on transportation to bringing the machinery all the way from the supplier place to our web place. We spent around $5,000 on installation and $3,000 on training. So the total amount which we incur is $218,000. This is called the initial investment. So we need $218,000 of initial investment 
to put this asset into use. All the amounts which you incur, all the amounts which you incur until you put the asset into use is called initial investment, including the cost of the asset. Now, why are we buying this machine, new machine? We have an old machine which was purchased seven years ago. Now we are getting orders, but the old machine is not uh, you know, giving an output, the, the, the quantity which we require. So we want to replace. Yeah. So when we use old machine, we are producing 10,000 units a month. But with this new machine, we can produce and sell 12,000 units a month. So there will be an extra production. We can extract around 2,000 units from this new machine. This extra 2,000 units require extra raw material to be purchased, extra cash investment. This 2,000 dollars or 2,000 units will be selling the goods on credit. Of course, your account accessible will increase. And this raw material required, you may have to buy this inventory from a vendor who will give you some credit also, isn't it? So extra inventory to be maintained, extra cash to be maintained, extra receivables we are going to have, extra accounts payable, your supplier is giving you minus, minus, yeah? So this is nothing but the working capital, change in working capital. That is going to be B. So A plus B. So this is the amount you need to maintain extra by having this new machine. Change in your working capital. Extra inventory, cash, receivables, minus extra accounts payable. Your supplier is giving you some extra credit. You informed him that you purchased a new machine. We need extra raw material. He will give you credit. So accounts payable is to be reduced. This amount working capital should be added to the initial investment. What happens to the old machine? We don't need that anymore. We don't need that anymore. Okay. Here say for example, working capital amount of say 22,000. So I'm writing 22,000 here. 218 plus 22,000. 240,000 is required. Oops, then we need to arrange this money, right? We need to borrow money or we need to arrange from our own sources. So we need 240,000. But what to do with this old machine which is giving 10,000 units of production? We don't need it anymore. So at least by disposing this old asset, can we reduce our requirement of 250,000? Yes, now we are planning to sell this old machine. So sale of old asset okay we sold this old asset for forty thousand dollars mm, we have some cash in our hand right that can be used to buy this new machine so we need two hundred thousand dollars this is the amount called initial investment actually we need two hundred eighteen thousand to put the new asset into the use, but it requires extra, you know, uh, resources to produce extra number of units, which we call it as change in working capital added to 218,000, arrived at 240,000. But we don't need to borrow 240,000 because we are planning to sell the old asset, which is going to fetch us $40,000. So effectively, we need $200,000. All right, so we understand A plus B minus C. A is the total amount required to put the asset into use, the new asset into use, which includes the cost of the new asset, transportation and installation, training costs.
because of the extra production we need some you know extra resources like cash inventory receivables minus accounts payable you need to remember this accounts payable is the credit we get from the supplier minus ap we'll give you a change in working capital that should be added to the cost of the new asset installed cast cost of the new asset and the amount received from the old asset after disposing it off should be deducted from these two amounts to arrive at the initial investment or cash outflow in year zero zero means beginning of the year so cost of the new asset the amount required to be paid to the vendor installation costs transportation etc then you will have installed cost of the new asset take an example here softy limited is planning to buy an asset worth 25 million dollars the shipment transportation and installation will cost us 2 million dollars there's a training required huge amounts of training required of 3 million dollars so the initial investment is how much yes 30 million dollars changes in working capital as the production is going up therefore you need extra resources like cash inventory receivables minus accounts payable this will increase your initial investment and any after tax sale to sit from old asset will reduce your requirements because this is the amount contributing towards your initial investment sale proceeds of old asset you will have some costs okay you will have some costs to remove the asset that are all to be removed that are all to be adjusted from the sale proceeds of old asset okay how we are deducting the old asset value like this let me show with an example old asset value is say fifty thousand dollars and we charge depreciation of say ten thousand dollars so far this asset was purchased say four years ago and uh, in four years we charge depreciation of ten thousand dollars so what is the net book value net book value is forty thousand dollars okay and we sold it for sold it for forty five thousand dollars hey there is a gain now so net book value is compared with the sold value so there is a gain of five thousand dollars when there is a gain there is a tax requirement to you know tax okay we need to pay tax on this say 40 percent so tax is going to be two thousand dollars we sold for forty five thousand we paid a tax of two thousand so deduct less taxes paid two thousand dollars so you have forty three thousand dollars in your hand this will become c in our calculations you remember a plus b minus c yeah you sold for forty five thousand but entire forty five thousand you cannot use it your in 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 your in, initial investment calculations you can only use forty three thousand dollars because effectively you have forty three thousand dollars in your hand okay this calculation is applicable when there is a gain on sale of old asset what happens if there is a loss what happens if there is a loss cost of the old asset is fifty thousand dollars for a period of four years we charge a depreciation of ten year ten thousand so the net book value is forty thousand dollars all right and we sold it for thirty thousand Hey, there is a loss sir there is a loss of how much ten thousand dollars 
when there was a gain you pay tax when there is a loss the tax department will have to pay you tax right hmm? will they pay no but what you can do is you can claim tax on this from the future tax liability you know so just get it approved from the tax authorities that we have a loss of ten thousand dollars upon the sale of this asset therefore we want some tax adjustment in the future tax liability so if the tax is at the rate of say 40 percent you get a tax benefit of four thousand dollars tax benefit this is called tax shield tax shield okay so in indirectly it is an inflow just assume that the tax department is paying you four thousand dollars what they say is that this can be adjusted in the future tax liability so you sold for thirty thousand thirty thousand is in your hand hmm? plus there is a four thousand tax shield at remember at tax saving on loss on sale of asset so total how much you have here 34000 this is your c in your calculations that is a plus b minus c $34,000. So, proceeds from the sale of old assets. Please make sure that you remove all the amounts like depreciation, any cleanup costs, removal costs, etc. Then compare with the sales mon sale money, you will come to know whether there is a gain or loss on sale of asset. If there is a gain, you should pay tax. If there is a loss, you should get tax shield you should get tax shield so to find the, the gain or loss you need to find net book value or carrying value by deducting the accumulated depreciation to the date of sale so the asset value minus entire depreciation for full year you may come across certain terms like makers depreciation makers depreciation modified accelerated cost recovery system is a depreciation charged by the government tax rules so if makers depreciation is applicable do not follow the company's depreciation methods okay you should follow the macus depreciation percentage and remember no salvage value is to be considered like say for example uh, a company purchased asset worth ten thousand five hundred dollars okay and the life of this asset is say five years after five years usage you will have a salvage value of five hundred dollars salvage value means residual value so you use this asset for five years and you will get 500 dollars upon disposal of this asset after using it for five years so depreciation per year is going to be like this cost of the asset minus salvage value divided by the estimated life of the asset so you have two year 2000 depreciation here but if the same question is with the Macus depreciation. So Macus depreciation says that the life of the asset is five years. Straight away 10,500 divided by five. You need to write 2,100 depreciation each year because Macus depreciation method doesn't consider the residual value. Okay. Sometimes the Macus depreciation may agree it for only three years yeah so company policy is depreciation for five years with a residual value of 500 dollars but macus rules are applicable here so straight away you need to charge only for three years please read the question carefully whether macus rules are applicable to the company 
you just ignore all the company related information for depreciation salvage value and all follow macros okay so what you need to remember when using macros is though it is given salvage value is given in the question do not consider because macros assume that the asset is to be depreciated depreciated down to zero 100 percent depreciation no salvage value and the rates may be different the time time period may be different you assume that the asset life is five years macros may assume it for only three years so you should follow macros rules while selling the asset old asset make sure your calculations should result either gain in the loss gain there is a tax loss there is a tax shield i have given one more example here there may be a loss there may be a gain if there is a loss you need to get tax shield if there is a gain you need to pay tax yeah in this example i sold the asset whose carrying value is 600 dollars but i sold it for 800 dollars so there is a gain of 200 dollars on the gain of 200 dollars i paid tax at the rate of 40 percent which is 80 dollars so 200,000 minus 80,000 okay is going to give me what no 800,000 is the sale value minus 80 dollars 80,000 dollars is a tax so i'm going to get 720 720 becomes c here this is a plus b minus c okay when the asset is sold for gain we sold it again what happens when the asset is sold at a loss the asset value is 600 we sold it for 500 there is a loss of 100 dollars right yes go and ask the tax department to get some tax shield so there is a tax shield of 40 percent on this amount forty thousand dollars we sold it for five hundred thousand we got a tax shield of forty thousand so total amount in your hand is five forty thousand so your c is going to be five forty thousand here a plus b minus c a plus b minus c will give you initial investment so far we learned about what the calculation of initial investment the calculation of initial investment a plus b minus c when the asset is sold at a gain when the asset is sold at a loss and also the treatment of depreciation if the company is subject to macros rule okay we implemented the project we installed the project we are producing the goods we are getting cash flows the second cash flow what we get is the operating cash inflow means what at the end of first year second year third year fourth year and fifth year during the life of the project we so far calculated what initial investment this place how much money is required now what amounts are received over a period of the life of the project is called operating cash inflow so in my previous example you are selling 12,000 units right 12,000 units times $1,500 per unit. Then expenses, all the expenses like, you know, the, the cost of the goods sold, admin selling, distribution and all. We'll get what profit before depreciation and taxes. Then you charge depreciation. You may have a question that why can't we, you know, charge depreciation here itself? You can, you can. Anyway, it is a minus item, you will get the same answer. But I'll tell you why depreciation is to be separately deducted in a minute. So deduct depreciation on the new asset. We are calculating operating cash inflows. Huh? So whether Macker's rules are applicable or not, depreciation is to be charged here as per the company's principles. The one which we discussed is about initial investment. So the one which we are preparing is like cash flow statement but it is a modified like you know cash flow statement from your income statement so almost income statement revenues minus expenses minus depreciation will give you profit before taxes 
deduct tax, add back depreciation. Oops, why are we adding depreciation back? Because we are calculating the cash flow. Depreciation is a non-cash expense, right? Therefore, we are adding it back. We want to know what is the operating cash inflow that is received each year. So depreciation is to be added back. Now you know why I asked you to you know direct depreciation separately. Whatever be the amount you are you know directing here, that should be added here. So do not club here. Okay. So direct depreciation separate item. Just add it back to the net profit after taxes to get operating cash flow. In simple, I can tell you this cash flow, cash operating cash inflow equals your revenues minus expenses minus depreciation into 1 minus T plus depreciation. So all the sales minus expenses minus depreciation. See, depreciation is separately deducted so that I know the amount what is to be added back here into 1 minus t that is a tax rate t for t for tax rate plus d so write this equation for small small questions especially in multiple choice questions you can do this way instead of in a statement format because it will take your time r minus e minus d within the brackets into 1 minus t within the brackets plus depreciation let me give an example we are selling 12000 units with the $500. This is the sale money, revenue. We have $400 of expense. This is an expense. This is the revenue. We have a depreciation of $10,000. $10,000. Okay. Now, we have a tax rate of 40%. Okay. So, you can do this way. The revenue is 12,000 times 500. This is the revenue. Minus the expenses per unit is 12,000 times 400. Okay. So we have revenue. We have expense. Minus depreciation of 10,000. Okay. Into 1 minus T tax rate. Plus your $10,000. Depreciation back add it to arrive at net profit after tax so you can save your time following this instead of preparing in a tabular format especially to answer multiple choice questions r minus e minus d into 1 minus t plus d t for depreciation to get operating cash inflows one more example 50,000 units, $500 of selling price per unit for $50. You can calculate even directly with the 50 unit, $50. 500 is your revenue with a cost of $450. So effectively, you are getting only $50, right? You can do this way. 500 minus 450, that is 50 into $50,000, 50,000 units. Minus depreciation of 200,000 will give you 2.3 millions before tax, pay tax, add back depreciation. The depreciation which you are deducting here, you are adding it back. Because depreciation is an expense, you can allow it as for tax purpose. That's the reason we are deducting and adding it back. After paying tax, we are adding it back. And this is the amount we are going to use in our capital budgeting decisions. $1,580,000 is the amount we received each year to get to, 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 you know, from the project once you implement it. You can do it in a tabular form. Yes, but it will take your time to show this amounts in this order. I don't suggest you to follow this. Better you follow the equation which I just explained you now. R minus E minus D into 1 minus T plus D. That simplifies your answer and you save your time. 
So changes in one networking capital, you must have to remember that this any liabilities like accounts payable, any accruals and all, they are to be deducted. I deducted $9,000 here. Okay. So your current liabilities are to be summed up and deducted from your total of current assets. So total of current assets is 22,000 and total of current liabilities is 9,000. CA minus CL gives you 13,000 changes in working capital. That is your B. Remember A plus B minus C initial investment calculation. Now the terminal cash flow also known as bailout cash flow. Bailout cash flow means when a project is terminated, you may have a question here whether it is terminated at the end of the economic life of the asset. Yeah, successful project. We completed the project lifetime, we earned money and we are selling this old asset inventory, collecting from our receivables, paying to the payables and all. What amount is in your hand by terminating this care, you know? project terminal cash flow sometimes unsuccessful project we thought the project life is five years but in three years itself we had to dispose it off because it is unsuccessful project yes what amount you are getting by disposing of the inventory the plant and machinery collecting money from receivables as of the date paying to the suppliers the surplus money is called terminal cash flow. Of course, it is a loss, but still you have cash in your hand called bailout cash flow. So, after tax proceeds from the sale of the asset which you purchased, it's not a new asset. In fact, the new asset which you talk about in the calculations, okay, then proceeds from the sale of old asset. If you still have this asset used in the business and change in working capital, because you are pulling out all the amounts back that will give you terminal cash flow in simple you are packing up everything okay so no more project no more project in the future so that project is going to be terminated then and there itself what amount you are going to get when you dispose it off so just to have a recap we were talking about capex capital expenditure which gives benefit more than a year and we need some kind of investment analysis called capital budgeting uh, begins with initial investment which is a plus b minus c operating cash inflows operating cash inflows remember r minus e minus d into one minus t plus d will give you operating cash flows throughout the life of the project here i want to explain about the operating cash flows types of operating cash flows even cash flows uneven cash flows what are even cash flows what are uneven cash flows let us assume that uh, we purchased an asset like uh, we purchased a bus passenger bus with hundred thousand dollars okay and we just had a contract with the corporate company that the corporate will pay you, say, for example, uh, $25,000 a year for a period of five years. So you will get $25,000 each year for a period of five years. So you buy this bus, passenger bus, hand it over to the corporate company, okay, and you will have cash flows. The contract is for a for period of five years. Five years each year you are getting $25,000. Is there, is there any change in these amounts over a period of five years? No. Okay. So these cash inflows are called even cash flows. The amount remains same throughout the life of the project. Yeah. Even cash flows. What happens if the passenger bus is run by your own company? Your company is a transport company. You are running on your own. First year, you got an inflow of 12,000. Second year, you got an inflow of 35,000. Third year, you got an inflow of 38,000. 
Fourth year, you got an inflow of 34,000. Fifth year, you got an inflow of 39,000. See, the cash flows are not same each year. They are fluctuating. Okay. So, they are called uneven cash flows. So, when you have the cash flows remain same throughout the life of the project, we call them as even cash flows. When the cash flows fluctuate over the life of the project, we call them as uneven cash flows. We will use even cash flows, uneven cash flows in our capital budgeting techniques in the next sessions. So we need to observe that whether the cash flows are even or uneven because we use different uh, formulae for different uh, you know, cash flows what we receive. Therefore, you need to know what is even cash flow, what is uneven cash flow. Terminal cash flow, we know that the amount which we receive upon the termination of the project may be a successful project, may be unsuccessful project. Capital rationing, we do not have enough money. Therefore, we'll have to cho be choosy in selecting the projects. The projects become mutually exclusive projects. If you have sufficient money, no uh, funding uh, issues at all, the projects are said to be independent projects, okay, and uh, I can accept all the profitable projects. They are not mutually exclusive projects. They are independent projects when I have sufficient money, unlimited funds available. Hope you understand the basic, the investment decisions lecture. We'll see you in the next session discussing about the investment decision, capital budgeting techniques like payback period, net present value, the profitability index, internal rate of return, and average rate of return, the risks on in our capital budgeting, and various other issues relating to the capital budgetings. Till then, have a good time. Happy learning.